Music can change the world. Music can affect your life. But to find the important stuff, you may have to dig a little deeper than American Idol. Welcome to the Deep Cut. This is a podcast that does that digging for you. We shovel through the surface noise that is known as Top 40 Radio and find the gems that are often overlooked. I'm your host, Mick Gray. Let's dig in. Irish singer-songwriter Thomas Walsh was a fan of music from the beginning, but when he heard British New Wave sensation XTC, he knew what he wanted to do. Hearing that Andy Partridge of XTC recorded in a shed at his home, Thomas Walsh decided to take a stab at the same and ended up with hundreds of demo recordings. In 1995, one of those recordings was awarded Demo of the Year by Irish music magazine Hot Press. From there, the word started to spread about the band that was now known as Pugwash. He came to the attention of many, including rock music's Fengali, Kim Fowley. In part one of this two-part interview, we talk about his influences and his relationship with Mr. Fowley and another Los Angeles musician, Jason Faulkner of Jellyfish, Air, and Beck fame. Today we were talking to Thomas Walsh, straight from the from Ireland. Yes. Crazy. We this is so amazing to talk to somebody that far away, but it's it's fantastic. How how are you doing today, Thomas? Oh sure, it's only I'm fine, Mick, thanks so much. Um I was just thinking Mick and your producer Anthony, they're they're pretty Irish names. We are. We have Irish roots, don't we? Yeah, my last name's Walker. Walker, that's that's English, but I let me away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it English? I thought it was Scottish. Oh, it could be, it could be, yeah. Walk, well, walkers have a very famous uh, crisp, yeah, we're... as in potato chip. Oh, yeah. And they're also, they're also a very <laughs> famous shortbread shortbread maker in Scotland. Oh. So, I, uh, you know, I, I, he's probably right. We... Anthony, you're probably right. We... Yeah, my, my grandfather's clan's uh, McGregor, so... Oh, well, that's, oh, Jesus, then you're Scottish. Wow, Scottish. that's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> well, you know, it was, it, was, it was amazing to go through America, actually. You know, we'll probably get to that later, but just to go through America and, and meet so many people who, who love the country. So it's very nice to be Irish in America. I've got to say that, you know. It's was, pretty nice to be Irish. Yeah, was, this la- was that tour your first tour to America? The big one, yes, because mm-hmm. uh, we were three months nearly, and we, we drove it, you know, we drove west to east. And, you know, for us being all mid 40s, you know, basically morbidly obese, some of us, uh, <laughs> and some of us, you know, still probably addicted to to uh, prescription drugs, and others who just, you know, mentally unstable. It was a tough tour, but well, it was brilliant. Well, yeah, I mean, you also had a, a really awful leg problem. I remember seeing you in San Francisco, and you had a, you could barely stand. Well, the thing is, you know, I'm hardly a picture of health anyway, but... It was the it was the van we heard. Uh, it wasn't we didn't get the van we were supposed to get. It wasn't very comfortable for all the driving we had to do. But also we were in San Francisco and our esteemed driver who, uh, let's face it, you need so people need to be a bit unstable to be van drivers to oh vans. God, yeah, you, you need to have something missing, you know, uh, apart from your legs because then you're useless really because you wouldn't be the driver. But uh, the thing was he he. He missed. We were collecting um, my other half uh, in San Francisco. She was she was hooking up to kind of go to a few gigs, and he missed where she was supposed to be collected. So he did a big, massive U turn, and he did one of his, you know, sexy Starsky and Hutch accelerate as you turn moments. Oh my god! And he just he stalled the van, but when I stalled, it jolted so hard that I just basically felt my spinal column coming out of my arse bone. Oh. And so instant, instantly, I had wrecked me back. I had to. So I did about six gigs on uh, tramadol. You know, heavy dosages of tramadol. So I basically couldn't stand up. But to put my leg up on a stool was the only way I could alleviate it. Alleviate it. Sorry. Yeah. And, so I went to a chiropractor in LA. Out in oh, I think it might have been out in Wall. Well, it might be out in Glendale, maybe somewhere that way. And uh, he just said, "Okay, yeah," and he lay me down and he basically yanked me all over the place and relieved it. Wow. So I was very, I did have to do about half a dozen gigs uh, off my tits, as they say. 
<laughs> yeah, that was oh, it. You, saw- you, you looked like you were in pain that night, but you did a wonderful show that night. Well, the show must go on. Well, hey, let's go back. Let's go back in time to when you were really starting to get into this. And I understand that you, you know, were really into Andy Partridge. And I guess he was, you know, influencing you enough where you you, you had heard that he was working in his own small homemade studio and you wanted to do, yeah. to do the same. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you you know, if you're going back, 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 back. Yeah. Um. Obviously, music was always there with my, you know, my father and my brothers. My brother bringing in, you know, Al Stewart records and oh. Mike Oldfield records. The other brother bringing in Queen albums. And then my brother bringing in ELO albums, which was the big one then, of course. Exactly. Uh, my father always had Frank Sinatra and uh, Bobby Darren and Perry Como albums. And my mother loved Mario Lanza. And, you know, and then you had, obviously, my dad would love the Carpenters and Gilbert O'Sullivan. And he would bring in those. So... There was a, a, a lineage of kind of, you know, a real strong uh, pop music. But, I mean, let's face it, uh, all records from them days, you're not going to go far wrong with melody, you know. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of melody. Yeah. Because, it, you know, certain things developed and then melody became a dirty word, I suppose, for a while. And, you know, so, but it always wins out, you know. So that's why I keep doing what I do because you can't give up on melody because that's the end of it, really. So, uh, so when my brother brought in ELO, I just went, you know, because I, because the amazing thing with the Beatles, the reason why the Beatles aren't mentioned is that the the, the Beatles were around like air, like you know, like the air you breathe, everywhere. You know? Yeah, yeah. You no, know, they were just, you know, they, you didn't have to explain. It was like you know the sun coming up. The Beatles were there. Yep. So, you know, you knew all the songs as a five or six year old. You knew all the songs. You didn't know why. Now we had a few singles, and you know, we had of course they were never off the radio, obviously. So radio was a big thing back then. But but when ELO... ELO are suddenly a band that were out at the time. And, you know, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God, they're, they're going. And, and look, there's a fan club. And look, you know, they're still a, they're a band. They play. They, you know, they release records now. There's a single coming out. Blah, blah, blah. So hmm. I just absorbed them. And, of course, I'm still absorbing them. And, I'm, you know, it's that's another story. But basically then, so when it went on, I just kept loving music more and more. But I love drumming. So I became a drummer very early on. And my dad got me a drum kit where all the different, all the parts were different. You know, every single piece of the kit was a different make. It was wonderful. And, <laughs> uh, and so I just, I, and then I just started playing. My brother was a guitar player. So we started to have jams. But all we basically wanted to do was we'd start at like 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning just because that would be like the letter B session. So we'd be out in the shed and it would like, we'd be all of the getting up at like 14 years of age. Like re- that early to go and play music, like play. I've got a feeling out in the shed, and you know. So it was just that's how I started to love it. But the more you get into it, the more I love the songs of Jeff Lynne and the Kinks and the Bee Gees and Neil, obviously Beatles, all that's of them. Some of the best stuff but, ever. I mean, all all those bands you you name are some of my favorites too. Well, that's the thing, and you know, I think obviously you start to go looking for, and you, and when someone like me then starts to want a bit of an a bit of an edge maybe because there is a bit of an edge and I mean because I love certain aspects of punk obviously because you love all types of music so you know you want little elements of each and then of course I heard XTC and I, I'd known XTC as a kid because they had a big hit with making plans for Nigel in the UK and of course a lot of the UK music was just would come to Ireland there would, there would, there would be no coming to Ireland Ireland and England are very close obviously yeah you know it's 25 minutes on a plane mm-hmm. and so you know, and of course, so many Irish are in England, so, you know, and so many English are in Ireland, and it's, you know, we're very, very close. The history, obviously, is weird, but that doesn't mean anything to the people, because the people just love each other. So we just, you know, so we just absorbed all the TV from England and all the music, and so that was it. You know, I basically heard XTC in 82, doing census, walking over time on the top of the pops, and I just went, well, they're very good. And I bought the single, but then I played the B-sides, and they were a bit weird. Oh, yeah. Andy <laughs> loved to put the weird uh, experimental stuff on the B-sides, right? Yes, but funnily enough, it was Tissue Tigers and Blame the Weather, which are actually brilliantly wonderful pop songs. It should have been on the album, really. should have been on English Settlement. But I just thought, nah, you know, because I was too young, you know, to get into the really angular stuff, as they call it. But then uh, three, four years later, I was, in a, I was in a little kebab shop in Dublin with some friends, and there was a video machine. Do you remember those things, 50 pence? 
No, and play two video videos. machines like a jukebox, but for videos. Exactly. Yeah. So it, they were just, you know, they became kind of popular in these places because these places started to open in Ireland around that time, you know, because we were way behind the time. Yeah. And, uh, and so I just went up and I saw Hey Jude, the Beatles, David Frost one. And I went, oh, that's cool. Jeez, gonna, well, that's going on anyway. And I looked around. Everything else was, you know, ridiculous mid 80s crap, you know, cutting <laughs> The Cotton Crew, maybe, or you know, they are you know, all these kind of wonderful, the silly bands, Kajakugu and all that. I was like, yep. block of sequels of that. Jesus. So, right down the end, because it was you know, it was alphabetical, it was like XTC grass. And I went, Oh, god, I liked, I liked that sense of walking around. I was like, I'll put that on. So, I put it on across the Beatles or Force. Na, 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 na. I was hey, just sitting there having a hot dog or something. <laughs> and the Bee Gees faded out, and I just looked up the screen, and you see the ball dropping, my balls dropped. Yeah, and uh, ball drop, and next of all, bang, grass, and I was just like, oh, you know, the hot dog falling out of mouth. Wow, it and, hit you. So, well, I couldn't. Basically, I didn't even say goodbye to my mates because I just went home and waited till the sun came up the next day to go and get the record in town to find it. Man. You know, I just. It was just ridiculous, and I just went straight in the next day. And of course, the great thing was they sold very little, of course. Yeah. So I went into all the secondhand shops I knew, and they had everything for ten p and twenty p, all the latest stuff. So I was like, oh, so I just spent about I don't know five old pound maybe, and I got everything, and I, I could, <laughs> and I just went this what, what, and then XTC took over my life, you know. Yeah. And uh, I told you you need more than an hour. <laughs> well, basically, yeah. well they, so, you know i mean that is that's very very interesting uh innovative sounds even for that time even for what they were quote unquote new wave i'm sorry xtc stood out from that group yes. you know? well well you have to i mean now we're talking about 1986 right it's exactly 86 87 it's exactly 20 years ago and people now are just I speak a lot to like 30 year olds, 25 year olds, fans online, they send lovely messages, whatever. And they think they're old, obviously. And they, you know, they're doing fine. Everything's grand. I'm only 10 years, 12 years, whatever, older than them. Mm-hmm. But they obviously haven't got a clue what it was like in early to mid 80s uh, with the music scene. Now, there was some great music, obviously. And you did love, I mean, you did love the specials and you loved Madness and you loved all these bands. Yeah. You know. But all of a sudden, the mid eighties went went fucking wonky. <laughs> like it actually went, it, it it did this mad twist. Now everyone seems to love the eighties again, which is fine because you look back and you go, "Well, yeah, that does bring me back." You know, that absolutely awful Madonna song brings me back and actually gives me some nostalgia, which is which is really cool. You know, the shittiest of songs that you hated at the time. You know, you can kind of go, oh, actually, that's well, I remember that. You know, yep. It's nice, but it was horrendous to, for that to be the, the nonstop 24 hour a day thing. Yes. Well, you know, well, you know like, you, I mean, here in the States, we have oldies radio that's yeah. 80s. And I'm yeah. sorry, when I was in the 80s, I was listening to, you know, what we called the college uh, charts type of 80s, which was not what they call oldies of the 80s today so it's like two different animals completely you know and it was so big college radio it saved xtc i mean college radio was yeah. the main reason xtc survived as a band because of dear god that was you know it. getting taken that on was it, that, the the, that the, was the little alternative when when alternative radio mainstream radio started i uh, i was working in college radio and they were stealing songs that we that they would see that would hit yeah. in college and put them on their little mainstream station that was starting out. <laughs> That's the Absolutely. way it all happened. Just showed you how lazy radio has always been, yeah. apart from when when it really hit and it was incredible. Yep. You know, if you're talking about the Luxembourg and, you know, the BBC, originally oh. Radio 1 and all those places. Yeah. I mean, they were just phenomenally cool, but they very quickly went, went all arseways because, you know, because commerciality and, you know, Things had to change and money had to be made. Yeah. So the music always started to take a, a secondary aspect in some of these stations. But when you, but radio is still so important. And what blows my mind is that you know radio could could so be it could be so huge with a diverse with a diversifying amount of music. I mean, when we were in America, 
there were so many great stations, but they still played the same old stuff. I mean, it, there's radio. so much stuff. Yeah, radio so is a stuff. mess in the States. It's it, I don't know. I, I, I have always loved radio, but I'm not sure how long it's going to last. It's it's it's. Well, trust me, it's, it's radio is is awesome in America when you when you live in Ireland and England. You know, there's, there's actually some great uh, British stations. There is BBC Six is a wonderful station. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, probably one of the best out there at the moment. And there's elements of Irish radio. You know, um, Radio Two here, there's a bit, RT Radio Two. There's some good programs, but you know, it's tough to find. But basically, with XTC, um, it was kind of like I found them, and then. My mind opened to everything because I mean, right at that year when Skylarkin came out, I mean, ELO disbanded. So for me, that was a huge thing because that was the end of my band bringing out new music yeah. and me following them. And you know, because I was into every, I mean, I'm a massive, massive Kings fan, yeah. I'm obsessed. So the Kings were always doing, but I mean, I just buy Kings records, but I mean, I actually think Think Visual was actually a really good album from that time, yeah, uh, one of their better ones. But you know, all the early 80s stuff I really didn't like, but. To me, I just kept collecting those bands. Like the Bee Gees had You Win Again, which is a huge hit. Yeah. But, you know, their albums would be just bleh. So I'd still collect them, but they weren't doing anything for me musically. <laughs> so That's the I way you do it. Like, when you love an artist, you buy all their music, you know? Absolutely. And that's why and people give out about people. I mean, if you, like, you know, Paul McCartney might release, like, he released Freedom, you know, that song for, yeah. for you know, the, the, for 9 11, wasn't it? And it's, it, it's pretty. Yeah, that's a pretty crap song, right? Yeah. But it's Paul McCartney. I, I don't... It's like, you know, it's like the person... Imagine someone invented the cure for cancer. And then the next day, you know, that they tried out something, a pill on a, on a guy, and he came out in a rash. And someone says, oh, what the fuck are you doing? God's sake. Look at me as a rash. <laughs> you know. And you go, okay, hold on. I, I, I cured cancer yesterday. Uh, so what? You know? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the, exactly yeah. the case with McCartney. He, he has such a of a catalog behind him. He, he, to top anything he's done is just crazy. The thing is, he still hadn't recorded one of his greatest records yet, which was Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, which yeah. is one of his greatest albums. That is a great you know? record. Yeah. And if you're a fan of his, if you're a fan of music, there's no way you could not think that's a wonderful record. But that's just, you know... That's the fan thing, and you can't really win on certain arguments. And fair enough, you don't want to win. You just want to tell people when they're gobshites. And, you know, that's an Irish word, by the way, for stupid. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Back on to you. Like, all of a yes. sudden, in the in the late 80s or around 90 or something like that, you have tons of demos. You you In your shed, you've made, let's say, 100 demos, and some guy yeah. by the name of Kim Fowley uh, notices it's you. How's oh, that? God. How does that happen? And tell us some stories oh. about this gentleman. Well, it, it was a little bit further on because when I, I I actually got the shed together around eighty nine ninety, and over the next three or four years, I did probably about two two fifty to three hundred demos. Wow! And well, it's just you know a hundred two hundred of them are completely utterly shit, but you know. <laughs> There's a nice selection of songs that would become certain songs, and there was other things that are just funny, and then there's other things that, you know, are kind of all right. So actually, I just, you know, because you need to survive in this game, I, I did bring them out over the last couple of years, uh, and I never thought I ever would even let anybody hear them. These are the shed Before, tapes you're talking about, right? Yeah, the, 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 exactly. So the the weird thing is they made me some money to live, and it was like, well, I mean, after all them years just sitting in that shed, you know, I wouldn't even do vocals because I was so scared about people. I mean, because I couldn't. My dad would go mad because I'd be out there at four a.m. <laughs> and he'd go to the, he'd go for a piss in the middle of the night, <laughs> and he'd be up in the toilet and he'd hear, <laughs> and he'd go, "He's in that fucking shed again." <laughs> and, he'd on. and because the electrics were plugged in with a huge extension cord into the house. He just pulled out the. Oh out the my way. god! He'd pull your power. Of course, would I mean it'd be like four a.m. and I'd be doing me fifth song of the night or some shit song about a fucking margarine a teepee or something, and you know, boom, and I go, okay, shit, me that. Oh fuck it up. So then you're finished and you go to bed. I'm done for the <laughs> night. Yeah. So 
was that was just you know that was that was brilliant you know that's what I loved but uh but anyway so uh, around 93 94 I a friend I went to a friend of mine who I'd known for years and he'd moved out of his mother's and he had his own place and of course all of a sudden my mind was like well your own place whoa look at this a little a little flat so where he lived there was a little tiny bed sit going uh available and after the very long story short I just applied and the guy said yeah you can have it it's there and I told my mother that I I was moving out you know just because of x y and z and she still cried and still gave out but I made the, the change and then when I went to that house it was just music all the time because all my ex-friends well sorry all my friends at the time <laughs> uh were huge music people like Keith Farrell who did all the bugwash albums uh one of the greatest bass players in the in the world let alone anywhere and you know uh so he became my kind of right hand man through all those early book rush albums well up to the horse duck with lewis as well which he did so i just it was just music non-stop and it was you know uh, music non-stop <laughs> and uh and so i, I just started uh, doing some more poshy demos and just for a laugh uh, i sent three or four songs that i did with keith uh up in the glebe house where i was living into the hot press which is a magazine and just as i sent it in kim Fowley had landed in ireland because oh. you know Kim, Kim is Irish, of course. You know, of course he's Irish. <laughs> and uh, but the great thing is, Kim did get an Irish passport because he was, he had got, you know, <laughs> generated whatever. So he landed, and he, he, literally the week I sent my tape in, uh, and the hot press put it in as demo of the week. Um, Kim said to the hot press, "Wait, well, who, who's the latest young guy?" What's the matter? And they said, well, look, we just gave this demo the week. He's a young guy. And, we, you know, we've heard bits and pieces about him. And just records at home. So he rang me. He got my number. And I answered the phone one day. And it was a phone in the hallway of the place. So it was a kind of a communal phone. And remember them days? Remember them days? <laughs> and it was, hey, yeah, you Thomas Walsh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Kim Fowley. I'm like, okay, I know that name. <laughs> He goes, yeah, yeah. Run away, case. Well, I did all this. And I went, did you did you write some songs with the boards? He goes, fuck it, yeah, yeah. Jesus, yeah. Skip batting. Blah, blah. And I went, yeah, cool, cool. I said, hold on. Colm, good friend of mine at the time. Colm, what are you doing? You're messing. I thought it was my friend messing. <laughs> and he went, I don't know any fucking Colm. <laughs> so... I went, oh shit, it's Kim Fowley. And I just had this great chat with him. And, and the thing was, I went in to meet him. He was, he was holding fort in this famous studio, Sun Studios, it's called, you know, the Irish version, uh, in Temple Bar in Dublin. Um, and he was in the middle there and he was just calling in all these young songwriters, as Kim would do. But I went in and all these people were going, he's a fucking prick. Don't, I, I'm going home. Don't, just don't go in. Of course, because Kim was being Kim. But because I'm still doing it and I'm still talking about him to your good self and I, I still will do music forever and whatever's happened since. and I went in because I knew he was a, an asshole. Yeah. Because I knew, cause I knew about him. The stories are all everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, because people didn't know who he was. They just thought, you know, oh, he's this guy. I knew some of his background, but you know, I even know about him working with Slade when they were Ambrose Slade and all this kind of stuff. And the seeds, you know, because I know my stuff. And I just went in and I went, yeah, he's a, he's a prick, but he's just great. Because look at him. You know, he's absolutely talking shit. And so we, we totally struck up a friendship instantly. And the minute he'd leave company, he's just, he was just the greatest, greatest guy. Now, I know all the stuff that's come out with the rape stuff and all that oh, heavy yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's, to me, in my opinion, I, I can't say because I wasn't there. But I just know that Kim was full of bullshit. And, you know, he was a bullshitter. He was a professional and, bullshitter, yeah. It's what got him where, oh, he, where he got. And, and see, he, he his persona was always like that. So you could easily back it up with an allegation like that. Yeah. That he definitely do that. Right. But but what I know is that he just, he, he was delighted if people hated him because at least they knew about him. You know? He lived this off his, he lived, he loved his reputation that he had. He absolutely loved it. I mean, he, I did some interviews on Facebook with Kim. And I swear to God, there's one I watched recently, just before he died, actually. I think it was in France. 
And the first two minutes of the interview is the most excruciating. <laughs> he, he talks about having sex with your offspring, dogs, snakes. <laughs> it's the most stupidest. He, you know, this was him all over instantly uh, causing some kind of an effect. Instantly being a, a fool. Yeah. Well, he recorded. He recorded that stuff. There's there's Kim Fowley records that the one of the tracks on the records. This is I think this records from like 1969 or 70 where he says, "And if you're a young girl with big breasts, be sure you get in touch with me as soon as possible." You know, I mean, this guy thrived on his image. He did. It was just and the thing was because I knew him because it's sad a lot of people are casting aspersions on him when he's dead and they didn't know him. But yeah. I was his best friend for five years. Wow! In Ireland, and the thing was because Ireland was a, was a, a kind of you know a, a very different place from him. He'd never been here and stuff. Um, he didn't go around like that, you know, as a person. He was just Kim. Yeah. But then, as soon as he got into a room where he was going to watch a band, he was totally Kim. He had to be that you know, character. Yeah. With the stick and talking the most ridiculous bullshit and. So I'd be laughing because I knew that wasn't him. So that's why I think it's a bit sad what's going on. Because he, because he was a genuinely loving guy with a lot of stuff, you know, right. a lot of but, issues. But you got it. But yeah, but I think, you know, like you say, he loved yeah. that image and he thrived on it. So it's, it, 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 sure, it's sad that that's the way he's being remembered. But man, that's yeah. what Kim wanted from the very get go. And to be honest with you, I mean, you know, he'd, I think as well in the Mayor of Sunset Strip, the, the Rodney Bigenheimer documentary. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's broached very quickly about those allegations in the movie, and you actually see Kim's real face. I think it's a very poignant little clip. I know we don't want to make him sound like Mother Teresa because he wasn't, <laughs> but uh, you know he, he's 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 asked about the allegations and he goes, "Hey man," he says something silly, but you see in his face he kind of goes, "God, I did, I did that. What you know." Well, there's a lot of mad stuff that went on. Let's face it, you know, he was always on the borderline of, you know, let's face it, he wanted to get a band together with 15 year old girls, you know. <laughs> Nowadays, you're going straight to jail for that anyway. Right. But, uh, but let's face it, Joan Jess stood up in the Hall of Fame speech in front of Paul McCartney and uh, Ringo and all these incredible people and said that, Kim Fowley, thank you so much. Yeah. And, you know, looked up at the skies because he just passed away and people applauded, you yeah. know, and. She knew him better than anybody. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, he so, he's an important person in rock and roll history. I mean, you got to face it. You know, from from nineteen, what is it, sixty sixty six or something like that, all the way through, he was finding uh, artists, connecting with artists, getting artists recorded. Oh my god! Are you mad? Sixty six. That's six years after he started. <laughs> he started. Yeah, he, he, was, he had his. Four, he told me he made his first million dollars. In 1961, I think it was 61 or 62. Oh, my God. Uh, with B. Bumble and the Stingers. Nut yeah. Rocker. Yeah, that's right. Nut yeah. Rocker. Yeah. So he was 18, he said, and he bought a pink Cadillac and he drove up and down Sunset Strip in his pink Cadillac and it, and had made a million dollars. And he said, I spent that million dollars in less than a year, he said. There really should be <laughs> a really good movie made of his career. I mean, I just well, think that would be so interesting. It would because the guy who played him in the in the Runaways movie was, I, to me, if if the Oscars mean anything, that guy should have won an Oscar for that. I thought, film. yeah, I don't, I never, even, I mean, I've talked to Kim Fowley once in my life, but I mean that when I saw that movie, I went, wow, this guy's this guy nailed him. Well, I'll tell you, I I'm getting goose pimples now because I haven't watched the film in ages, but I literally sat with my jaw on the floor. Wow, he, it was him. That's I've never amazing. seen somebody. Do that. Do somebody so brilliantly. He was him, and of course, he looked like him at all. It yeah. was frightening. And the thing was, they actually portrayed him pretty, you know, strongly in that movie, and rightly so. But they, like, it, that, that's all pretty much true. Apart, you know, what are personal things? I suppose you know that were yeah. that we're not talking about, but not not knowing about. You know, I'm sure there was some mad stuff, but like. Let's face it, everyone loves is it MC5 and they, they've raped women in their room and, yeah. you know, you know all those stories about, you know, gang rapes and all these ridiculous things. It's all wrong, of course. But, you know, this was a completely different time. Yeah, it was. You know, it was. You know, the, the LSD was legal, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> you know. That alone you know, it, changed everything, right? 
Trace, if you're going to do LSD and it's legal, you know, you never know what you could get up to. Let's be honest about it. But uh, with Kim, anyway, I know we're going to, we've definitely gone off the tr- track a bit, but Kim just got on really well with me. I got on well with Kim. Did you record really well. with him? I did about, I've, I'm on about four Kim albums. Oh, wow. And I, I, the thing was, you went into some studios then one day, and what Kim would do, I've got amazing Kim Fairley stories, by the way, you wouldn't have enough time. But, <laughs> Uh, well, one day he, because he, he, he was big in because Americans and their teeth, of course, we all know about that. We all know that English don't give a shit about their teeth. Uh, Irish people love their teeth, but Americans idolize their teeth. So, <laughs> Kim came to Ireland basically, you know, he says, I had to seek out new talent. I, you know, like he was, like he was Captain Cork or something, you know, and you know, seek out new life and new possibilities. Yes. And, but then he, he let it slip one day. He said, I came here for the fucking dental. So he, he came to Ireland to get free dental work. That's basically <laughs> what Kim did. Which is genius on Kim's part. But typically, because even if it was, it was free, but what he wanted was specifically really, really good work. He still had to pay for some of it. So what did he do? He asked me to come along with him and play music in the dentist waiting room oh my to God. get a reduction. So I didn't know this. He says, bring a guitar. Meet me at two o'clock. Blah, blah, blah. So I came along with the guitar and I went, Kim, this is a fucking, this is a dentist. Uh, you know, and he goes, yeah. And I went, what are we doing at a dentist? Uh, we're going to do a gig. And I went, in a dentist. And he goes, yeah. I went, oh, fair enough. It's Kim, I suppose. This will make sense in a minute. So went in and there's like some kids and his mothers and a few people and they're all holding their face and the and Kim and me sit down and he goes, Okay, Thomas and he's talking and the whole you know the way waiting rooms are silent. Kim just stands up, like you know, he's nine foot fucking tall and he looks like a skeleton. And, you know, kids are starting to cry. <laughs> and you know, All right, Thomas, play Mark Bowling chords. <laughs> I start doing the key. <laughs> E to G or something, you know, all that. And he's going, oh, I'm here in the dentist's office. Uh, I'm going to get my teeth done. All you dogs are sitting around. All this, you know, you know, it's so easy to be Kim. Everything is dogs and teddy bears. Yeah, classic so, Kim. So, so he just starts, I'm sitting there and I'm like fucking mortified. You know, I'm just, oh, Kim, you bastard. You know, this is, this is low. He went in, he came out. And he, we walk out, and he goes, I says, Kim, don't ever ask me to do that again. Are you fucking mad? And he goes, Thomas, he took 500, <laughs> he took 500 quid off, he says. <laughs> <laughs> he took, he gave him a, 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 a discount because he did the live performance in the. Kim went in and absolutely did his spiel. But he also said, I've just been entertaining your weight room. <laughs> just the whole thing, the whole package. He got 500 quid off and he was delighted. He was, he could scam better than anybody. That's only one thing. But we went into Sun Studios and, and did about 23, 24 songs off the cuff with him just making up lyrics and reading some lyrics and me just making up chords God. and playing chords. And two of them came out on this uh, album, Sex, Cars and Death or something or whatever it's called. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, one's called Everybody Dies. And uh, there's another one. I don't know what it's called. I I have them. I do have them. But I swear, it's not that I haven't promoted them. It's just that people know I worked with Kim, but I never really got into the whole, oh, I'm on this record with Kim. I'm on a record that he mentions in Mayor of Sunset Strip. Wow. And the reason, and when I seen it recently, because I hadn't watched it in A's, I watched it recently, and I burst out laughing because he's such a lawyer. He said to, uh, he's sitting with Rodney Bigenheimer, and and Rodney's going, well, I, uh, I'm still doing the radio. And Kim's going, oh, you're not fucking doing the radio. <laughs> Shout. Shouting at him, berating him, you know, like Rodney's like a little dog and puppy and Kim is like this absolute lion. Yeah. Yeah. And he goes, what are, you, what are you doing now, Kim? What's going on? He goes, well, I'm number one, I'm number one at the moment in Yugoslavia. He says, well, <laughs> you should watch the clip. And, he, and, and Rodney goes, really? And he goes, yeah, this... Terrible record, Slick Willie and the Arkansas Frogs, right? Yeah. And I, I'm on that record. <laughs> like He's right. It's horrendous. And the cover is the worst cover you've 
ever seen. Oh, it's a cartoon God. drawing of Bill Clinton playing the saxophone oh, my at a God. Sex, sex pool party. So, you know, but the name of it is Slick Willie and the Arkansas Frogs. And there was no way it got anywhere near the Yugoslavian charts. <laughs> I know that for a fact. I'll have well, to check just, these out sometime. That sounds outrageous. <laughs> But you know, sorry, you, you, uh, you know, don't get me going. I'm I, <laughs> well, I loved it. I I wanted to hear some Kim Fowley stories, so thank you very much, Thomas. That was fantastic. I I go back as a Kim Fowley fan for years. And years. Your first record that came out, in, uh, what was that? Is that 1999? Yes. Um, so that's what happened, basically. I, I got really back into it because I, I started pretty late. Even though I was doing music since I was, uh, you know, in my 7, 8, 9, 10, drumming and stuff, uh, I just I just thought I was going to be an Andy Partis and a guy sitting in a shed making demos and not really, you know, going anywhere. But all of a sudden I went, oh, God, it's, I'm getting old. I better do something. And I got a collection of songs together and we... I don't know how we got. We got some money up. I remember my friend from the band Lear, Irish band Lear. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just said, "Come and support us at this gig in Dublin." And we're going to bring along our label guy. He's a guy called Michael O'Shea, and he's a lovely guy. And see if you get on. And Michael loved my songs, and I, you know, straight away, what a great guy Michael was and still is. He's a great friend of mine, and he did my first two albums on Velo Records, which was an Irish label. Uh, and he he couldn't he he got some money up, but he couldn't really pay for the first record. But I got some deals with friends, like for a house we could record in, and so we we hired uh, ADATs. My God, you know what ADATs are? No, what's that? Well, it's basically a, a, it's a tape that's slightly bigger than a VHS tape, but uh, so it, it so the machine itself is a big kind of like a big VHS tape machine. Yeah. But it's got all the stuff, faders in front. So, so it's like a little desk, a little recording desk. But it's all recorded onto these tapes. But if you want to have 24 tracks or 16 tracks, you have to have two or three of these machines. And they're famous for falling down and breaking and, you know, just stopping walking. Wow. So, you know, we had to get the only four ADAP machines that were in Ireland. Oh, my God. Because we mixed the album finally. Uh, we had three tapes of, of overdubs and stuff. And then you have to have a tape running time code. So we had to have four machines. The four machines just kept breaking down. So the mix took weeks. It was ridiculous. But we got the album done for about four grand, maybe old money. And uh, that was Almond T. And that was an interview Andy Partridge did in England in some magazine. And he was asked about his favorite things at the moment. And he said, I love Almond T. Wow. So it's, it's, you know, why not? You know, and, and you heard you that know. right then when that happened, when when he said that, or it got back to you quickly. When well, it's funny you should say heard it because that's the way we think nowadays because everything is internet and phones. But this was the the printed article. Oh, you know, oh, so you actually read that? Yeah, it was like the Young Cut magazine or something, or Mojo or Early Q magazine or something like that. It was one of those. God, and how I, did I you how did you feel when you read that? Well, no, he, no, this is Andy just saying. I love almond tea, the drink. You know? <laughs> he wasn't said, talking a, about your album? No, he didn't know me then. And I said, what a great idea for a title for a record. <laughs> oh! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not, we're not the adulation bit yet. That was to come. Okay, so, but, uh, so he's just talking about almond tea, and that's what you named your album after. So it was always the XTC thing.
Oh, it's, you should see the, the original copy of Almond Tea, which, which you just can't get anywhere. It's just ridiculous. Because you only printed a thousand or something, whatever it was. Uh, I thanked, like, KFC and uh, God and Jeff Lynn and Roy. I thanked all these people. I thanked everybody in the planet. <laughs> Oh, it's ridiculous. It, the, the thank yous were just so stupid. But it's amazing to think that all the people I thanked, I've actually gotten to know. That is unbelievable. I've, I've gotten to play with, or I've actually, you know, I, I've been in their houses, or I've, I hang out. With, it's just, because I'm still a very normal, working class. Yeah. Speaking of, a, of guys you know that you met through your music, yeah. that I one of the guys I really love a lot, that on, in 2002, when you made Almanac, um, a guy by the name of Jason Faulkner, uh, contributed to that record. How did you get connected with him? Well, did you hear me saying Jason Faulkner and Obi? What was that? I said Jason Faulkner at the start before you said who it was. Oh, <laughs> I think I was talking over you. <laughs> Anthony, listen back to the tape. <laughs> That's That guy is one amazing Los Angeles musician. Well, if there's somebody, you know... I'd marry just, you know, like as in if you want to get like a green card or something or do something weird, it's Jason because he's the most fucking beautiful man. He's just, you know, he as well, we felt we got to know each other through a genuine love of XTC as well. Ah, yes, that's right. He loves them too. Yeah. That's a real weird story. And I'll, I will do a quick for you. <laughs> but, uh, basically, a, a good friend of mine who, when I moved into that house I was saying earlier, and I started doing the posh demos, uh, Stephen Farrell, he was the brother of Keith, who I'd mentioned. Uh -huh. uh, he was in a band in Ireland uh, called Mundy. Uh, the guy's name is Edmund Enright. And so he called himself Mundy. That was his nickname. Uh -huh. but Mundy was the next big thing with Sony UK in 1995. He was 18 years old. Wow. He used, to, he used to come and rehearse in the house where I lived, of course, because Stephen and Keith were upstairs and they were all involved in it. But Sony came in with like a million pounds. This was back in the day when he still invested. Remember those days? Oh, different time, yeah. Different time, uh, yeah. And, and Mundy was 18 and he was a very, very talented kind of Bob Dylan uh, poppy songwriter. I mean, I'm great friends with Mundy. He's still doing great stuff, but he does it mainly in Ireland now and just does certain gigs over in America. But it's kind of, he had a huge hit with Galway Girl. Uh, you know, the Steve Earle song, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, Look, he had, it, it's like one of those biggest songs ever in Ireland thing, you know, up there with Tin Lizzy. Wow. So he's, he's really well known, but they tried to break him as a kid around the world and Sony put millions into him. They really did. So his first album was produced by uh, Ute and uh, Flood, you know, all these producers. Yeah. Uh, and Mike Hedges and all these guys. So all the money was being pumped. But what he did was he went on an American tour for the for their debut album, which was called Jelly Legs. And because it was on Sony, Sony would say, look, you know, to all the people who were involved with Sony around the world, they say, look, come along to this gig. This is a young Irish guy. We're putting a lot of money into him. Come and support him. So, of course, I was a huge Jason fan, a huge Grays fan, a huge Jellyfish fan. And I'd got my friends Stephen and Keith into Jason. Because, you know, I was obviously the guy that had stuff. Like a drug dealer, but with pop. <laughs> I am the same way. A pop dealer, yes. You know what I'm saying? And so <laughs> so when Stephen was in the band and he went to play in L.A., uh, Jason turned up because he was on Sony at the time. I, I think he was still on the Greys uh, deal, or the Greys was just got to coming out. Yeah. And the Greys, I think, is on Sony, isn't it? I think, I think it, is. it is, yeah. And uh, So Jason came along, and... Stephen Farrell says, oh, God, you're, you're Jason Faulkner. And he goes, yeah, yeah, it's great. Great gig. And he goes, my friend, of my, a friend of mine is a huge fan of yours. And he got us into your music. And uh, and Jason says, well, look, here's, here's my number. If you're ever around again, he gave him his number. Huh. So when Stephen got home after the tour, he said, oh, I met Jason Faulkner. And blah, blah, blah. and uh, he said, there's his number. He gave me your number. He gave me the number. And I went, oh, God, that's brilliant. So one night I had a few drinks in the days when I drank. <laughs> And I just went out to the phone and I went, and I rang Jason. Just totally, you know. Out of the blue. Next time, you know that wonderful American dial tone. <laughs> and, hello? And I went, 
it's, it's not Jason. He goes, yeah. I said, yeah, this is Thomas Walsh. I'm a fan and you, uh, 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 you know, stupid stuff. And I says, but I said, but hold on. I says, is that, is that Rhodes Girdle the Globe playing behind you from Drums and Wars? He goes, yeah, my son, my brother are playing XTC is Drums and Wars. So when I rang, <laughs> he was playing Drums and Wars. And again, we just, on the phone, we, we struck up a friendship on the phone. Had a brilliant time. And then we started emailing, and this was just as emails and internet was going silly. Yeah. So I used to go to the local internet place, and because I hadn't even got a computer yet. Oh, God, I sound old. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Nick, I sound old. We are. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was it. And the thing was then, he'd say, right then, uh, Tom, I'm coming to Ireland with air. I'm touring with air. Wow. Uh, do you want to put on a solo gig? And I'm uh, sorry, this is the second one, the first one. And of course, you don't even. Can I tell you the story of the first one? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> it's a brilliant story. We're enjoying these stories, yes. You have time, and you know, of course, digital, you can let it run. But uh, <laughs> basically, he was he, when he did Can You Still Feel, he got the support slot. On the Alanis Morissette World Tour. Oh, gee. And this was a huge thing, obviously, because what a what a tour. That was the one just after Jagged Little Pill. It was our yeah. follow-up. And so she was the biggest artist in the world, probably definitely close to it anyway. And he had a band, which was Kevin Agunas on bass. Uh, I don't know whether you know Kevin, but brilliant bass player. Yeah, I don't know that name. A lot of, well, he still plays, obviously, but he's, he's done a lot of incredible stuff with Jason mm-hmm. over the years and other people, of course. But... um. The drummer was Jeremy Stacy, who's in Noel Gallagher's High Flying Boards oh, now. Oh, yeah, was in yeah. Zero seven and played in the Finn Brothers with his other brother. Wow. Uh, so Jeremy, I know years, actually. But the thing was, so it was a three piece. And so Jason says, I'm coming to Ireland and we're playing in the Point, which is the big place, you know, the seven, ten thousand. And we're supporting. He says, but can you put on a, like, I'll play a, so- I'll play a solo gig. I'll play a band gig with the band, but he says, you can't, uh, you know, no one can know about this because Alanis has a strict policy that we, we don't do with our gigs or if we do, they're not promoted and they're just kind of fan gigs. So, you know, Jason wasn't a household name in Ireland, but I had friends and people who were like, Oh my God, he's going to play. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, he's a huge cult star, but Ireland is so small. So I just said, leave it with me. And I got this brilliant venue place called The Funnel, and it was rec- it was across the Liffey, the River Liffey in Dublin, right across from the venue where the gig was with Alanis. So we had everything worked out. I did a few flyers and put them around shops in Dublin, just little photocopy flyers saying about the gig. And didn't Miss Morissette go for a little shop <laughs> in Dublin? And because Dublin is the size of a fucking postage stamp, uh, she saw one of the flyers. Oh, no. Next of all, I get a phone call uh, from a security man. And he says, yeah, it's just Mr. Walsh. I went, yeah, yeah this is Mr. Walsh. He goes, uh, can you come to the uh, Point Depot uh, this evening at 6 p.m.? Blah, blah. And I went, um, yeah, I, I can. And, okay, well, let me see you there. Uh, it's in connection with uh, a gig you have promotion you're doing promotion for for jason Faulkner. i went okay, okay. <laughs> so i was just baffled and i went along and i turned up and there was like three security guards like fbi guys <laughs> you know burly big black men three black men it was and there was this main guy and I, there was a, like a seat a, a, a seat a chair in the middle of a room and it was like no i had to sit on it Stood around. Is this like a, an interrogation room? Tarantino movie or something. <laughs> and the ear bitten off just for a laugh. Yeah, right. And I wouldn't have minded. Steelers' wheel were brilliant. So, but the thing was, I sat down and he went, You're promoting a gig with our support act, Jason Fogger, and, and in his contract. And I went, Oh, uh, I'm sorry about that. This, and I said straight away, I said, Look, this has nothing to do with Jason. Um, Obviously, he wanted to play uh, a gig for me because I'm an old friend of his. And uh, we just said, look, it'd be great to see you play the songs that we love. 
and maybe in a support slot he wouldn't be able to do them and of course it's all Alanis fans tonight and and you know so I'm really very sorry and he goes okay well give me give me a minute he walks out he comes back in he goes uh, we're very happy with this story uh, we're, uh, we're glad it's a charity gig isn't that right I went yeah charity gig yes yes and go, okay so charity gig is fine and uh, and we'd like Miss Morissette would like you to come along and see the gig tonight uh, because Jason can't leave before she fin- <laughs> before she finishes so she wouldn't allow Jason to leave before her gig ended jeez um, in a, in a way, you think of the mad stuff that goes on now, but, you know, if she's bringing out, if she's going out on one of the biggest tours in the world and you're, you're, you're bringing the support, you know, uh, I suppose there's going to be a few stipulations, isn't there, you know? Yeah. She, she's going to expose to millions of people and all that, whatever. Anyway, so the brilliant thing was, I saw Jason then, he went, oh, man, you, could, you know, it's all okay. I said, I'm really sorry, Jason. And he goes, no, don't be silly. It's totally stupid, but what can you do? You know, it's all okay now. He says, We'll come along to the gig and we'll stand outside the stage. We'll have a laugh and then we'll go and do the gig. We'll all go over in a car and, we'll, uh, and I said, okay, I told everyone that the gig will be later now. It'll probably be about 11 o'clock, blah, blah. So, all cool. Went to the gig and standing at the side of the stage and, you know, it was cool. We were walking in and out having a drink and, you know, buzzing. And it was great to see her in her prime, you know? Yeah. Just, just doing thing. And just before that, she's doing, it's not fair to remind you. It's one of the last songs. And next of all, there's a whole host of people coming to the stage, big guys with torches. And next of all, there's a little kind of a, okay, okay, listen up, listen up, everybody. Miss Morissette will be coming off the stage in 90 seconds. <laughs> so we we stipulate again, as we do every night, no eye contact with Miss Morissette. No <laughs> eye contact. <laughs> and Jason just looks at me. And, of course, Jason knew me by then. Obviously, we, we'd known each other for a while. And he just nudged me. And looked at me and started laughing because he knew that I was going to stare at her straight into her eyes. <laughs> I was going to stare straight into the woman's face. Absolutely. Even, you know, I was going to animate it even more because what a most stupidest thing. But in fairness, I wasn't there to offend anyone. I was just, I was laughing and I was out there having a few drinks. So... So the the brilliant thing was the band kept playing the da, 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 to remind me. No, those chords. They yeah. keep playing them. Vamping. Walks off stage. It was mental. It was brilliant, you know. And they're playing and they're fucking rocking it. And she was so she comes down the steps and they have all the torches, you know, to light her feet and over her head and all that stuff. And uh, she comes to the bottom of the stairs and I just stare straight into her, face. stare straight into her face. And Jason grabs me. He goes, "Fuck's sake, stop!" <laughs> so she went by no one knows it because it was just a it's just a joke so she went by and went into her dressing room and then people said okay people people can leave now Jason you can do that gig it can happen now so okay that's cool so the band keep playing for five minutes she doesn't she's stead in her dressing room right and the band just keep playing but the thing was when we were leaving then we had to go by her dressing room as we were leaving and as we're walking by well you know I had to look in, of course, because I have to look in. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> you know? And I looked in, and she's sitting on top of the, of a, you know, the kind of tabletop. We well, you know where the, the bulbs, the lights on the mirrors are. You know, you know, just the, just the top of a table. Yeah. And she's sitting cross-legged, and she's meditating. Wow. She, she's going, she's going, um, um, right? In the and, middle of that. <laughs> I don't and the place called mental and she's meditating how can you meditate in that <laughs> that is the most that's the most i said that's the best five minutes rock and roll I've that ever is had. real rock and roll yeah that's the real deal there dang meditating you know f- fuck all this throwing tvs out windows you know it takes a lot to do that yeah just left and of course the rest is history because jason played the most phenomenal gig uh, that night, I I did Wicked Annabella with him. Oh. Uh, I think I wrecked me amp. I don't know. I just we all went mad on it, and but I have it all. I recorded all this stuff on, from desk and all. I got all them gigs, and uh, we have some pictures. There's some stuff on YouTube. I think Wicked Annabella is on YouTube. Oh, I have to check that out. Yes. 
Of the day and goes about a simple way. Take some more. I, I seen her hair, I seen her face, a little old smile, yeah. I, I felt it rise, burning my soul, twisting my mind, yeah. Ooh. That's just very that's cool good. that you got the, I mean, he is, I got met him once too. And he just seems like the f- most fantastic guy and his musical, his musical expertise is just phenomenal. All the bands and his solo records. God, great. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, he, he, to me, he, he, he wrote songs that were, that were up there with the greats for about three or four records. No denying it. I mean, he was, and you know, you see him playing live, and you just go, "Oh my god, this this is just ridiculous." Like he's 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 a genius. There's no denying it. Very important part of my second record almanac, which you'd mentioned. You know, he he played and he came along. What happened was it was just after nine eleven, and one of the only bands that were still touring the world were Air, and it was it was September. Yes, it was October two thousand and one. I think it was, or very close to uh, Halloween. Halloween, you know. Uh, hmm. And they were playing in Dublin Air, and Jason said, "Look." I can get out after the sound check because it's it's a it's a fly in fly out gig, but I can come after the sound check and play on the album. So we brought him straight up to the house, and he just listened to a track once. And my so he's he's on three or four tracks on on Almanac. He's on Monorail. Yeah. Uh, keep moving on. And he just walked in and recorded him. Just walked in because he's because he's brilliant. You know, I mean, I I don't like to mess around with listen to stuff too long if I'm working on something either. But you know, with Jason. You know, he could just walk in and then play the, like a Frank Zappa lead guitar break on a, on something, and or sit down and play like Rick Wakeman on the keyboards, and then you know suddenly sing like McCartney. Yeah, you know he that's who he is. God. So he did that, and he did it in three hours, and then we we just had a brilliant night. So it, that was Jason on Almanac, but it was very important for me because that record sold 119 copies, <laughs> and I did. That's officially what it sold in Ireland. <laughs> And then it was, and then the company went bust, and so uh, all the stock, about seven hundred copies of the album, which hadn't gone to the shops, uh, was withheld. So, because it is Ireland, and you know, because uh, there's a lot of things you can do in Ireland that you can just get away with. Um, you know, we do live by the law, of course, but at this time, I just said, because I was so frustrated, I said, I'm going down to the warehouse, which is St John Rogerson's Key. It's a U2 building. And I went down with a friend of mine who had a truck and I just went in and said, look, lads, uh, you've got a warehouse full of, you know, Whitney Houston albums here and, you know, Madonna albums, all these albums that were big at the time or whatever, you know. And I had a little tiny stack of 700 CDs in the corner because I was under the same distribution company. And I said, look, I know they've gone bust and everything's gone arseways, but if I don't get my CDs back, I'm dead as an artist. 
So, could you help me? And he went, hold on a minute. And he just came out with a little forklift with my 20 boxes and just put them on the back of the truck and off I drove. <laughs> wow. So, all the stock that was left, I brought home. And what I did then was, because of Jason's connection, uh, a lovely girl called Linda, who, ra- who ran his fan club, which she still does online, uh, she said, do you mind if I if I let people know that you have copies of the album and you can sell them through our fan club. So I sold them at the time for $10, including postage. Wow. And I think one sold recently for 250 quid on eBay. <laughs> it became a little it's bit a of a collector's item. Well, they did, absolutely, because it just became one of those records that pe- people got to know Ford or Field in Ireland because I sold them. I sold basically 99% of them to American people. Crazy. So... It just became this thing, you know, people are getting touched, go, do you have a copy of Almanac? And I don't know. So there you are, the end of part one of my interview with Thomas Walsh of Pugwash. We end up talking about his 2002 album Almanac. Part two starts up where we left off, talking about how Almanac led to the recording of the next record, Jollity, in 2005. We hope you enjoyed part one. Thank you for listening, and big thanks always to my super producer Anthony Walker we go out with this amazing tune from Pugwash's 2002 release Almanac it's called Anyone Who Asks tune in for part two and keep digging